here on a vacation, but I invited him to talk to us because he's got a, a background that I think will be interesting for a lot of people here. Um, John got his, I never remember this stuff. He's my brother, I gotta look this up. He got I don't his, remember it either. Well, I'll <laughs> his Bachelor's of Science in Physical Geography at uh, the University of California Davis, back in 1985. And his Master's in City and Regional Planning at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in So he would fit right in well here. Um, and the reason I wanted him to come and talk to you guys is because he's on the cutting edge of developing policy in California to tackle this issue of climate change. In California, which is sort of on the cutting edge of so many things, um, they, are now, they now have a state policy to begin to address regulating carbon dioxide emissions. Now, how's that going to work? He's writing policy to do that. So it gives you an idea of what the issue is there. Also, what a city planner does if you graduate from the city planning program or visit the geography. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Mr. John Rickenbach. Come on up here. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just as weird being on the other end of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, just to give you a little background beyond my academic background. I don't want to belabor too much, but if you have questions at all, you can interrupt me. Um, my background is in geography and then planning. And what I am is an environmental consultant and a planning consultant. And um, I work for a firm called Rincon Consultants. It, it's, a, it's a whole industry that's it, it's not exactly unique to California, but it's, there's a lot of such consulting firms in California. What we do is a combination of doing long-range plans for cities or counties like doing general plans that you might be familiar with, or called specific plans in California, uh, which are a smaller version. But we'll also do a, a variety of environmental studies. We might do noise studies or air quality studies if someone wants to build something. What, what's the effect of the noise? Or how much traffic will it generate? But we'll also do full-on environmental compliance. Now that's something that is, is done under federal law under the National Environmental Policy Act. But California has its own version, which is very, broadly accepted by the entire fabric of how things get done. You have to implement that. And what we do is full on environmental impact reports. If you want to build a large development, you can't just get the permits to do it. You have to go through this whole environmental compliance step where you have to disclose, here's what's going to happen if you do this. And here's what we're, you're going to have to do about it. And here's when you're going to have to do about it. And here's how much it's going to cost you to do about it if you want to go forward. So that's what I do. So the concept of um, making policy and all that, well, we work with agencies, cities and counties, and the state to help them in doing what they do. Now today, um, what I want to talk about, and I'll, let's see if I can do this remotely. Maybe I can. What I need to do. Or I'll just, I'll do it. okay, you, you, you can. Good. 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 Yeah. Um, go ahead and hit those things. I want to tackle a few issues here. Um, the basic thing is I'm going to talk about, you can hit the next two, just to get all the bullet points up here. I want to combine a couple of issues. One has to do with water, one has to do with climate change. And I want to give you a little bit of background about California's water situation. And um, ultimately, the fact we're dealing with a place that doesn't have a lot of water, but has a lot of people and a lot of demand on that water and how that's affected policy generally, or how California's response to that has been, which is to say, always in the crisis mode. 
Then you throw climate change on top of that, which in California, um, the, the consensus view is that uh, the, the rainfall, which is already not great there, will become even less. And the snowpack, which feeds California, is going to become even less. So how does that affect everything? What you have when you combine those in a state that's got a fertile mind for dealing with problems, um, you have a pretty quick policy response. You add to that other outside influences, such as the Kyoto Protocol and such, and you've got the beginning of a germ of how, how we can actually turn what the scientists are saying into something that we can actually implement on the ground. And is there a desire to do that? So um, go ahead. And, and then I want to end up with, OK, where, where are we going next with this? And what's the implications, both in the state, but nationally and globally, as a result? Uh, I want to start a little bit about what the reality of water in the West is all about. It's a lot different than water in the East. These pictures, by the way, are actual pictures I took. Those are on the Green River in Utah, uh, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with southern Utah, but it's probably my favorite place to go anywhere in the world. There's a lot of great places to go. And this is a good example of, um, that's water in the West. Mostly they're, they're streams in deserts. And so you really have to, to accept that's where the water comes from, that and groundwater. Um, and by the way, that's an old Anasazi Indian ruin, probably inhabited a thousand years ago, right along the river. Very brief background here, and some of this is old news for all of you, but, but the idea of water in the West is, is um, it's always been known to be a place that, that's been bereft of water, except for from the Eastern perspective. If you'd never been to the West before, you would have assumed everything is out there like it is here. But things aren't green out there, except for from about March to May, and then they turn brown again, because all the rain comes in the winter. And um, when John Wesley Powell first was out there doing some exploration in the 1860s and 70s, later on helped form the USGS, um, the, the doctrine that there isn't a lot of water was something that he really tried to instill in that agency. What that led to ultimately was the formation of what was then called the Reclamation Service at the federal level, now the Bureau of Reclamation. The whole point of the Reclamation Service was to literally reclaim land in the West through irrigation and building dams and creating a way to um, use what little water there was. Now, there weren't a lot of people there at the time, but there was uh, certainly the idea that you had to do something about that early on. So, so that was that was that was one issue that came up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the concept of the appropriate versus riparian doctrine. Here in the East, the concept typically is there's enough water around. You put your bucket in the water, you use it. It's your water. You've got there, you can just take it. Because there's the presumption there's enough water. In the West, the presumption has been, from the legal standpoint, you have to get a right to use the water. And so if you take water out of a river, you have to have a, a right to use that. And you can take that and use it somewhere else. You don't have to use it right there on the site. Um, that's an, a, a very important concept because in the West it means you have to get in line and there are fights that can ensue as a result. One great example of that was when Colorado, was, Colorado River was divided up, the major water source in the West. Put it in perspective what the Colorado River holds. It flows through, on a good year, 18 million acre feet of water. Uh, the Mississippi River system, I think, I'm going to guess, 800 million acre feet of water. The Columbia River is probably 350 million acre feet of water. So again, the Colorado system, all of the Southwest, 18 million acre feet of water. Uh, that was divided up in the 20s during a period when it was high rainfall, when you look at the climate charts. And um, so it flowed pretty well. So the, the law that divided that river up assumed too much water. And so when the seven states through which it flows, California being one of them, divided it up, it was bound to lead to a dispute later on, because the actual flow is closer to 13 million on a regular basis. Uh, that was never a problem in the 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s when there weren't many people. But once all the states like Arizona, Nevada today, um, California obviously, started growing more, then it became who's getting in line first. And that leads to disputes. And that's one example of the, the water problem. So from a policy standpoint, you knew water was going to become an issue in the West through the 20th century. Um, th this is a shot of Lake Powell in Utah, which is the main, one of the two major reservoirs along the Colorado, the other being Lake Mead. Um, this is the upper one, which was designed to feed the upper base 